Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the Friedman LLP tax webinar, Reform in the Trump Era. At this time, all lines are in a listen-only mode and the floor will be open for questions following the presentation. If you would like to ask a question, please utilize the Q&A function on the right side of your screen. And it is now my pleasure to introduce your host, Bob Sharon. Please begin. Thank you, Sandra. I'm Bob Sharon, partner and tax practice leader of Friedman LLP. Joining me today is Ryan Dudley, a partner and head of our international tax practice. Ryan Dudley specializes in developing cross-border commercial structures and financing strategies to optimize international operations and transactions. With nearly 20 years of public accounting and investment advisory experience, Ryan's clients have ranged from Fortune 50 multinational corporations to private equity and hedge funds to small businesses and startups. In addition to Ryan, we have Kimberly Dula, a partner in our tax practice. Kim has 25 years of experience providing tax planning and compliance services to high net worth individuals and their closely held businesses and private foundations. Kim also provides her clients with consulting and compliance services required to fulfill their estate, gift, and fiduciary needs. And finally, joining us is Michael J. Greenwald, corporate and business tax practice leader and partner. Michael has over 30 years of experience in public accounting. He has served clients in a variety of industries, including financial services, technology and media, manufacturing, wholesale distribution, private equity, real estate, construction, and professional services. Michael is currently the chair of the Partnership Taxation Technical Resource Panel of the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. More importantly, however, is who is Friedman LLP? Friedman is a leading provider of accounting, tax, and business consulting needs of public and private companies since 1924. We are consistently ranked among the top 50 accounting firms nationally by both Public Accounting Report and Accounting Today, and also ranked among the best places to work throughout the accounting industry and all regions where we operate. Friedman's Tax Services Group is dedicated to helping clients maximize their tax position and uncover opportunities in light of changing international, federal, and state and local tax requirements. We are committed to making certain the needs of business owners work in tandem with their personal tax needs. For the second consecutive year, Friedman conducted a web-based tax survey amongst companies across the United States, focusing on New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and the Connecticut areas. Launched in early 2017, held responses from more than 480 senior leaders of companies across various industries. The goal of this webinar is to share key insights from Friedman's recent tax survey. These insights include how other business leaders would react to tax reform proposals, the mixed reactions to international tax reform, and how businesses would adjust their structure to take advantage of proposed tax changes. This webinar will also update you on President Trump's proposed tax changes and their potential impact on businesses and individuals, including highlighting unintended consequences taxpayers may not be aware of and will help you prepare for the changing landscape ahead. So at this time, I'm pleased to turn the presentation over to my colleague, Kim Dula, who will give you an overview of how business leaders view the more significant tax reform proposals according to our recent survey. Thank you, Bob, and good morning, everyone. So we asked these 480 business leaders which tax proposals they viewed most favorably, and the results were somewhat what you would expect. Many individuals are, are quite frankly, just looking for overall reduction in tax rates, as well as some sort of simplicity, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, lower individual income tax rates, though, however, topped the list with 82% of those who were surveyed indicating that they were in favor of a reduction in individual income tax rates. Currently, as many of us know, there are seven individual tax brackets that we're dealing with, and the highest bracket being at 39.6%. President Trump's proposal reduces those seven brackets down to three, so we could potentially be looking at a 10, a 25, and a 35% bracket which would mean a reduction of 4.6% for those who happen to find themselves in that highest bracket. 
I know many of our clients here at Freeman were excited to hear about the possibility of uh, the proposal that would mean a lower individual income tax rates, and many of them reached out to us and, and asked for, you know, what is it going to mean, what, what changes am I going to see to my taxes, and quite frankly, there's still some important details um, that we're missing, and, and the most important with regard to these brackets are, is you know, where are these brackets going to begin and where are they going to end? And until we have more information about that, running projections or doing modeling is, is somewhat impossible. So we just need to hold tight a bit until we get some additional information about those brackets and the lowering of the individual rates. Um, second was lower corporate tax rates, which came in at 72% of those being surveyed. Um, obviously, the business leaders are looking favorably on that. So that makes sense that, that those would be interested in, in lower corporate rates. Currently, the highest corporate tax rate is 35%. This rate applies to uh, C corporations or businesses that are taxed at the entity level. Um, President Trump's tax proposal looks to reduce this rate to 15%. Now, what is interesting is that this new reduced rate would not just apply to C corporations, but pass through entities as well. So those businesses that are set up as S corporations or limited liability companies or partnerships where the income is now being taxed at the shareholder or member level um, would now um, also be benefiting by this lower rate. Now, there are many, many details of this part of the proposal that are still being worked out. Um, there is a concern from some uh, about somewhat trying to game the system, if you will, and really take advantage of this 15% minimum tax. Um, one example uh, of something that's being looked at is the whole thing of reasonable compensation, um, and that's something that's been scrutinized in the past but is, will be looked at even more heavily in the future should we see this 15% uh, minimum rate. Um, share, and what does this mean? So shareholders of S corporations um, may now want more of their income to be passed out to them via ordinary income um, and in order to be able to take advantage of that 15% rate rather than having to pay ordinary income tax rates on salaries and wages. So again, that's just something that will be looked at um, as, as more and more information about the lowering of the corporate tax rate comes out. Um, rounding up the top three is the elimination of the estate tax, with 64% of those surveyed looking at this as, as being favorable. And, of course, this is no surprise since many business owners are looking for ways to transition their business or just their wealth in general um, to the next generation. So at first glance, uh, the elimination of that tax certainly seems like it's going to be helpful. Um, what is interesting, though, and another reason why that 64% may be so high um, is the fact that we asked another survey question to these business leaders, and, and that survey question was, you know, of, of those, you know, being surveyed, who currently has an estate plan and those who may have an estate plan in place, who's revisited that plan in the last five years? And over 50% of those surveyed indicated that they either didn't have an estate plan at all, or if they did, they have not revisited the plan. Um, so, obviously, then, the elimination of the estate tax um, would be something that, that those surveyed would look favorable upon, just one less thing that would need to be dealt with or worried about um, as they're looking, you know, to, you know, to do succession planning with regard to their business. Now, as the chart in front of you indicates, there's obviously a multitude of other bullet points that are, that, um, are being addressed through Trump's tax proposal. And as you can see, over 50% of those surveyed indicated that in one way or another, they're looking at different, um, different of, these, of these bullet points in a, in a favorable way. Um, one thing that I know that I felt it was pretty interesting is the fact that one of the bullet point items is actually the possibility of the reduction or the elimination of some tax deductions. And 52% of those surveyed actually indicated that they felt that that was something that was positive, which I felt was pretty interesting considering, um, you know, who would want to see the elimination of any type of deduction. But I really think that these results um, show how similar people are thinking um, back to when we did our 2016 survey, and there was an overwhelming cry for just simplicity in the tax code. People just want to understand how their tax is being calculated, the income that they're being taxed on, and 
how they're benefiting by these deductions. And it seems like individuals are saying to themselves, I'm willing to even, you know, get rid of some of the deductions um, just so that I can understand what I'm paying tax on and how all this works. Um, I know so many times our clients will call us and they'll ask questions about, you know, am I getting the benefit of my state and local income tax? And that then leads us to a discussion about the alternative minimum tax. Or for every dollar I give to charity, am I, you know, how much am I saving in tax dollars um, with that deduction? And then we're having a discussion about phase out of itemized deductions. Many, many taxpayers are just, they're looking for simplicity because they're frustrated. Um, and maybe that's why we saw such a, you know, a high answer to that survey question. So with this talk of reduction or elimination of, of tax deductions, you know, what, what does the proposal say? Um, right now we could be looking at doubling of the standard deduction, and for many who right now take advantage of that standard deduction, it, it quite possibly is just a pure win. Um, if you're getting a standard deduction of $12,000, it will go to twenty-four. dollars That should just mean, um, you know, more dollars in your pocket. Um, for those who itemize, maybe they will find themselves taking the standard deduction because it'll be more beneficial. And again, what does that mean to them? Um, less taxes and quite possibly that simplicity that they're looking for. Um, itemized deductions could be reduced down to only two. Um, we would only be able to take advantage of quite possibly mortgage interest deduction and the charitable contribution deduction. So that would mean the elimination of state and local taxes, real estate tax deduction, miscellaneous itemized deductions for things like investment fees. Um, and these are things that, that many people are able to take advantage of or get benefit from. So Kim, if yes. they eliminate uh, the state tax, income tax deduction as an itemized deduction mm -hmm. and also eliminate the alternative minimum tax, doesn't one kind of offset the other? That's funny, but not necessarily. I mean, it's, it's actually it's an interesting question and one that keeps coming up. In essence, it's almost like in for, with that particular with those particular items, we're almost replacing what we know as our regular tax with the alternative minimum tax. Right now, for AMT purposes, many of the deductions that we see for regular tax purposes are eliminated, and then we're taxed at 28 percent. Now we would be getting the deductions that were allowed for alternative minimum tax purposes, which are our mortgage interest and our charitable contributions, and we could be looking at the highest rate of 35%. So it's a great question and all the more reason that as these things unfold and we get more and more details, don't take anything for granted. Reach out to you know, your accountants, run projections so that you're preventing any surprises in the future. Um, one other item that I do want to point out that we're not really hearing a lot about are medical expenses. Um, I always tell my clients, you know, you're very fortunate if you don't see a deduction for medical expenses because the thresholds are so high. But unfortunately, there's many elderly taxpayers out there who find themselves incurring um, exorbitant fees for home health care workers or, um, or if they're staying in uh, assisted living facilities, and they are getting an advantage for those medical expenses. That advantage could now potentially go away. Um, with that, we could even see the elimination of some above-the-line deductions, so not necessarily itemized deductions that we see on Schedule A, but also deductions that we see right on the face of your 1040. Um, again, things like the self-employed health insurance, and with health insurance being so high these days, um, that could be a, a, you know, a, a big benefit that we could now be losing. Something else worth mentioning from the survey results is that 61% of those surveyed were in favor of the repeal of the Affordable Care Act, more specifically the taxes that relate to that act, so the 3.8% net investment income tax and the 0.9% Medicare surtax. This mainly is affecting those with adjusted gross income in the $200,000 to $250,000 range and above. Um, again, this would be a nice tax break for many, but I think many are just looking for that simplicity. These are just two more taxes, two more calculations that they need to understand and just things that they need to um, plan for. So if they see the elimination in that, um, they're looking at that very favorable, favorably. Um, Finally, changes on the international tax front are also something that people wanted to see, although we certainly need many more details in order to truly form an opinion on this one way or another. Uh, repatriating overseas profits at a reduced rate, um, that rate is yet to be determined. Uh, territorial tax system and cross-border reporting requirements are all changes that are being proposed. 
uh, couple these changes with a reduction in the corporate rate, and the hope is that many businesses will either return to the U.S. or hopefully will never leave uh, to begin with. Thank you, Kim. In light of the mixed reactions to international tax proposals from our survey respondents, Ryan, can you dive a little deeper into the responses surrounding these proposals and highlight some of the implications for our listeners? Thank you, Bob. Uh, and before I go into the survey results relating to international tax reform, it's probably worthwhile just pointing out uh, a few elements in the current environment uh, in which this whole discussion is taking place. So uh, perhaps four, there are many elements to consider, but four I just bring to your attention. Uh, first of all, most major developed countries have some sort of value-added tax or uh, uh, goods and services tax, and the U.S. does not. While there are state and local uh, sales taxes, uh, the U.S. federal government relies uh, very heavily on income tax. As a result, the U.S. has the highest corporate tax rate in the world. There was obviously the 35% that, that Kim just mentioned, plus state and local taxes. So uh, in the developed, amongst developed countries and our trading partners, the U.S. Uh, effectively has the highest uh, corporate income tax rate. The U.S. also has a worldwide tax system. So U.S. corporations suffer tax on their worldwide income, whereas most of the rest of the world uh, has adopted a territorial tax system, which means that for business profits, they are only taxed, co corporations are only taxed on the profits that they earn in that jurisdiction. Uh, and then finally, just the current business environment in which uh, we all operate. In today's environment, intangible property uh, is, uh, is one of the biggest drivers of value, and that can be moved to anywhere in the world very freely. Similarly, capital can be moved anywhere in the world very freely. And so corporations really do have a choice about where they're going to earn their profits. And so with all of that in mind, I, I think we, we have seen for many years uh, foreign companies who invest into the U.S. creating the smallest imaginable footprint in the U.S. and U.S. companies going to great lengths to uh, invest offshore, move intangible property offshore, and sometimes even move the entire company offshore, all in order to uh, minimise uh, these tax burdens. And while this may be a, a rational response from the company, uh, it's obviously not great for the U.S. economy or uh, the jobs that are, uh, are leaving the U.S. for foreign jurisdictions. So with that in mind, with those drivers in mind uh, as to, to what's really uh, pushing the international uh, tax reform case, we uh, asked some questions in our survey. Uh, including the favourability towards uh, a low-tax holiday for the repatriation of offshore earnings, uh, concerns about US tax reporting, and whether the proposed border adjustment tax would be beneficial or harmful. And we did get a, uh, a very mixed reaction to all of these things, uh, although perhaps the most uh, mixed, perhaps of the whole survey, was really the border adjustment tax where there were clearly going to be some significant winners, uh, but also a lot of uh, very significant losers from the introduction of such a tax. Um, now, we, we will talk about the border adjustment tax. I should point out that the border adjustment tax was not mentioned in the latest uh, uh, tax proposal from the uh, Trump administration, and uh, that the Treasury Secretary has actually come out uh, and, uh, and not really favoured the border adjustment tax. But it is still quite relevant in that all these other proposals that are being put forward, or most of these other proposals, will lead to a very, very significant uh, uh, budget deficit, potentially trillions of dollars over, over a 10-year period. The border adjustment tax represents one way of potentially filling that uh, hole in the budget. And so anything that generates revenue at this point, we can't, uh, we can't really ignore. So 
If we uh, go to the next slide, so um, in relation to uh, the repatriation of offshore earnings, uh, we the, the result of the survey showed that 61% uh, of those surveyed were in favour uh, of having a low tax uh, repatriation holiday. Um, interestingly, this was not universally supported. That uh, it's sort of interesting that 39% uh, were not in favour of this. We think that part of the reason for this is that, uh, first of all, it would seem that some sort of uh, repatriation holiday would in fact be a reward for those companies that have been shifting profits and business activities out of the US for many, many years, and so to some extent almost rewarding bad behaviour. Uh, and definitely the, the major beneficiaries of this type of tax break are the largest multinationals. So companies like Apple, Pfizer, Microsoft, GE are the companies that have tens of billions of dollars offshore that will be repatriating these amounts. And this type of benefit is unlikely to assist uh, uh, smaller businesses and mid-sized businesses who clearly haven't been able to take advantage of these, uh, these types of benefits in the past, uh, deriving income offshore in low tax jurisdictions and so on. So, so that's uh, uh, an, a, an important factor. Ryan, do you have a, a favorite jurisdiction uh, for a company that might be uh, trying to put their operations offshore, or does it depend on what type of business they're in? It re every, uh, I think with almost every client, uh, there's a different answer for that. In some cases, the major driver will be where they can get uh, good software engineers or the, uh, the ability to distribute into particular markets. Uh, for some, uh, it's uh, going to be the uh, specific aspects of that jurisdiction's tax regime, whether it can act as a holding company, an IP holding company, uh, and, and various other things. So it, it really does vary from uh, client to client, situation to situation. In relation to uh, uh, our next question, um, if there was a repatriation holiday so that uh, these earnings did come back on shore, it was interesting to see that there were uh, some very, there was very positive feedback about how that money might be used in the US economy. Uh, so, for example, um, the, uh, oh, sorry, um, uh, sorry, I think I've, I've, if we just go to the next, you jump sorry, did I, oh, no, that's fine. Um, so, um, so of that, uh, approximately 23% uh, said that they would use some of that money for capital expenditure and 20% uh, would use that money uh, to uh, co further compensate employees, presumably through bonuses, uh, salary increases and the like. Um, now 40% did say that they would return the money to shareholders, but that in and of itself is not necessarily a bad thing in that uh, obviously that provides more money for uh, uh, consumption, more money for further investments uh, by pension funds, and so on and so forth. So that's uh, that's not not a bad result. Then, in relation to the border adjustment tax, as I said, this might have been the the uh, uh, most controversial of uh, of the questions because there were clearly those who were in favour of uh, the border adjustment tax. But still, there were some very significant uh, losers uh, from uh, the introduction of such a tax. So uh, in this case, we see that uh, uh, approximately 25% of survey respondents felt that the border adjustment tax would lead to additional costs that they would need to pass on to their customers. And uh, that uh, such a tax might actually cause them to reduce the amount of activities that they have 
in the US and potentially refocus their business activities in jurisdictions outside of the US. There were also approximately 9% who felt that this would impact how uh, they would uh, access imported goods and there were concerns about shortages of uh, imported goods for their own production processes. So this was clearly something of, uh, so as I say, there were some who benefited from this, but a very significant number of survey respondents who had uh, material concerns about the introduction of such a tax. Brian, before we go on, you mentioned that most of the developed world has uh, some form of value-added tax, uh, and that in this particular uh, regime, uh, it's a, generally a revenue raiser, and a clearly, if we're going to have some kind of tax reform that involves lowering corporate rates and lowering individual rates, uh, that we need some revenue generator as well to uh, and get as close to revenue neutral as is conceivably possible under those circumstances. So if, if, uh, if the, the border adjustment tax that's been proposed creates such a, a wide diversity between winners and losers, uh, how is it that other countries that, that have a value-added tax don't seem to suffer that same uh, consequence from implementing it? Right, so the border adjustment tax is I would describe it as a very blunt instrument that uh, really only looks at uh, uh, goods that are being imported and, uh, and exported. They don't look at incremental value. A value-added tax seeks to impose tax at each level of production and each level of added value, uh, and so doesn't have the same impact as the border adjustment tax. Uh, so, for example, if a retailer is importing a good for $10 and expecting to sell it for $12 uh, the, by being denied a deduction for, their $10, for the whole amount of that $10, they, are, uh, they, they effectively need to pass that full tax cost on to their consumers. Um, whereas with, with value-added taxes, you look at each step along the way of the production process, and so the consumer ultimately ends up uh, paying the tax on, on, on a final price, but uh, it, it is on the, it, it's at a rate appropriate for the total amount of production as opposed to uh, uh, just the, uh, effectively a burden on the imported component. So under, understanding that and, and understanding that there is some regressivity to a value-added tax, although it would appear significantly less than with a border adjustment tax, uh, and, but that same regressivity would apply in whatever country uh, had that value-added tax. What's the, what's the objection to having a VAT? So one objection to having a VAT uh, that has been raised is that uh, people don't trust Congress <laughs> to uh, to keep the VAT rate low and income tax rates low. Uh, so one proposal a number of years ago was to eliminate income tax and simply have a VAT tax. Uh, but if a VAT tax was to be introduced, they don't trust Congress just to keep it at a modest rate. They're concerned that it may raise up to, uh, say, a 20% rate which is, is not uncommon in Europe, um, and still have the same 35% corporate income tax that we have anyway. Thank you, Ryan. In our survey, we asked business leaders if they would be willing to adjust their business structures and sources of financing to better align with proposed tax changes. Mike, can you walk our listeners through the responses and what these responses tell us in terms of some underlying issues and concerns? Sure, Bob. Uh, so one of the proposals uh, that was included uh, both in the, the House uh, blueprint uh, as well as the President's one-page uh, tax reform proposal uh, was this concept of eliminating uh, interest expense, business interest expense deductibility 
in favor of allowing full expensing of, uh, of uh, capital uh, expenditures. Uh, so we, we wanted to see what business leaders thought of this and, and whether it would affect how they structure uh, the capital uh, part of their balance sheets. So uh, first question we asked them actually was, how are you currently financed? And it turned out that about 75% of the respondents were financed either totally or partially by equity, uh, predominantly, predominantly equity versus debt, uh, and, and only about uh, uh, 30, uh, about 21, 22% uh, were financed predominantly or solely by debt, uh, which was a bit surprising for us to begin with. Um, but what we, what we got out of that uh, was that about 72% of the respondents said that if business interests weren't deductible, uh, that they would change uh, how they are uh, how they're raising capital to run their businesses. Uh, about 17% said they wouldn't change, and, and 11% uh, were undecided. We think from these results, which seems somewhat counterintuitive, that there may be some misunderstanding in the community. Not surprising, since there's been so little detail about exactly how this would be implemented and exactly what it would mean. Um, but nevertheless there's clearly a willingness to react to, uh, to whatever comes out in, in the form of tax reform. Uh, you know, again, it's not clear currently what it would mean to have full expensing, uh, who actually gets to deduct that. I'm thinking in terms of, uh, say, your typical uh, real estate partnership that might borrow money to buy a building, uh, might have some active members who actually participate in the management of that property, but might also have some passive investors, whether those are family members or outside investors who come in. Uh, is it in fact the intention of the President and of, of Congress to allow these people to take a, a full deduction? Uh, how is this going to interact with the current passive loss rules, uh, which would prevent that? So, so it, it, all of that is unclear. Uh, it, what might happen, one of the, you know, we'll talk about later about some unintended consequences, but, you know, uh, some uh, tax writers who have been looking at this are wondering whether uh, farms are going to become the new tax shelter. Uh, we know that um, if you watch Field of Dreams, for example, that most uh, farms are uh, heavily financed with debt. They borrow uh, to buy seed and to uh, buy equipment to uh, uh, plant whatever it is that they're growing or whatever they're raising, and then uh, after they've taken that to market and sold it, they pay off the debt. And it's a cycle that goes on annually and has been going on for, for generations. Uh, if that interest weren't deductible, it would be very difficult for all but the largest corporate farms to actually finance uh, their operations. And so the question is, would this now create an opportunity for the farm to become the tax shelter of the future? Uh, so we're kind of following that and, and waiting for the details. But clearly, um, you know, and we think this is true across the board, uh, business leaders are, are quite prepared to make whatever changes are required. Um, the one thing we've heard loud and clear in, in anecdotal conversations with people is they don't care what the rules are, just give us the rules of the road and then leave them alone so that uh, we, can, uh, we can plan our business activities, our investment activities, uh, and move forward. Uh, one uh, you know, interesting point is that uh, you know, we see every year uh, in the past, at least the past decade and a half, that we come to the end of the year and there are so-called extender bills. Uh, businesses hate extender bills. Congress loves extender bills because they usually occur after an election so that they don't have to worry about the electoral consequences of it. But, uh, but businesses hate that because you go through the, through the entire year, sometimes even past year end, uh, without knowing exactly what you've done during the year uh, is going to result in a tax benefit or a tax burden. So, uh, you know, again, uh, tax reform is fine and welcome, but then what business leaders would like is just for Congress to leave everything alone. Uh, the other uh, proposal that has generated a tremendous amount of attention uh, is this concept of business tax integration, which would mean that the, the tax 
uh, rate on business income uh, would be applied uh, irrespective of how the business was organized. So whether it's a sole proprietorship or a flow-through entity like a partnership or an LLC or an S-Corp or a regular taxable C-Corporation, they would all pay tax on their business income the same. Uh, and that there's some, you know, merit to that. There's some economic logic to that. Business income is, after all, business income, and it should be indifferent to the form uh, of organization. Uh, so the the question we ask is, uh, if if that were the case, uh, would you consider consider uh, changing uh, the structure of your business? Uh, and uh, what we found was that. Uh, about 60% of those uh, said they would consider uh, reorganizing to be treated as pass-through entities. Uh, and, and, and we found that, uh, we found that to be an, an, interesting, uh, an interesting takeaway. Uh, you know, again, it's not clear how this is going to be implemented. It's not clear how it would apply to, uh, say, uh, service businesses. Uh, you know, and we can talk about that at length at some point. But it's, it's one of the issues, and Kim alluded to this, is that if you do this form of business integration, uh, what do you do with respect to reasonable comp? Uh, if you're a business owner and you both work in the business and you have capital invested in the business, how much of what you earn is because of your services and how much of what you earn is because of the capital that you have invested or because of the services of your employees. So this idea of integration is going to cause some uh, additional work for accountants and lawyers uh, in an attempt to figure out what is the reasonable compensation uh, of, a, of an owner of a flow-through entity. So uh, we're kind of looking forward to that. I mean, I've seen a number of tax reform uh, tax reforms uh, initiated uh, over the years that I've been practicing, and uh, they always have one section that we consider the accountants and lawyers full employment provision, and I would say that uh, uh, tax integration across uh, business entities would be uh, the provision in this particular proposal. You know, Michael, you and I have been uh, practicing a number of years. Have you ever seen such a uh, dramatic proposed tax change legislation condensed into one page? Uh, no, uh, uh, but it's, you know, it, it raises an interesting question. If you look at the history, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a geek when it comes to taxes, so if you look at tax history, about every 30 years or so, uh, there's been major tax reform. We had the original code in 1913. We had the reform, the, the, uh, the tax code of 39, tax code of 54, and tax code of 86. So we're about due. Uh, it's kind of like uh, you know, thinning the forest to, uh, to allow it to grow. But normally it's a subject of tremendous uh, study and, and effort and, and, and lots more paper uh, comes out. Uh, just anecdotally, the Tax Reform Act of 1986 uh, was about six years in the making. It started in 1982 uh, with a proposal by Bill Bradley. There were two major studies that came out of Treasury, uh, one before the uh, election in, in 84 and one at, or right after the election in 84 and then one in 85, uh, and there was a, a lot of study and thought and comment and negotiation that went into it. Uh, and you, can, you could argue that the Tax Reform Act of, of 86 started with Ronald Reagan's uh, uh, State of the Union speech, in, but, uh, but in fact it was, uh, it was quite a bit more than that. So the answer, the, the long answer to your short question is no. <laughs> and, and Mike, I have a question. I mean, with regard to the reduction of the corporate tax, the potentially drop to 15%. I mean, as we know with C corporations right now, there's this whole concept of double taxation. So you have the tax at 35%, and then when the dividend comes out, the individual shareholder is taxed as well. What would happen to that? the dividend piece or the, when the profit gets stripped? Well, it, it's not clear, but you, but you raise an interesting point. If you're talking about the corporate rate dropping to 15%, but the top individual rate being 35%, right now for most corporate dividends, yes, the corporation could be paying tax at 35%, but the dividend gets a reduced rate in the hands of the individual at 15%. So it looks as though overall corporate earnings 
might be taxed at the same rate, it's just coming out of different pockets. So again, it's not clear that there's any real change going on. Uh, it's just moving things from, from, one, uh, from one pocket to the other. Uh, my question for Ryan about reducing the corporate tax rate, uh, and Bob asked him a question of work, if you were gonna park your earnings overseas, if we reduce the corporate tax rate to 15%, does that now make the US a, a tax haven? Uh, or will there be sort of a, a race to the bottom to see who can, which, which country can get the lowest rate and therefore the most investment? Right, so, so definitely 15% plus uh, state and local taxes, uh, the U.S. won't be considered a tax haven, but it would definitely make the U.S. much more competitive. And if we think of the U.S. for, for most goods and services, the largest market in the world, uh, good rule of law, good finance sector, uh, highly educated population, many other factors that are beneficial for just doing business. If the rate was to be reduced to 15%, then I think the US would be a far, far more competitive jurisdiction and those companies looking to shift uh, business activities offshore, looking to potentially shift the whole corporation offshore, uh, would think twice about doing that. Um, so, no, I wouldn't say that uh, I wouldn't say that the U.S. is a tax haven uh, because even at 15%, there are a lot of countries that are still even lower than that. Um, but at the same time, it, it would make the U.S. Uh, it would give the U.S. a lower rate than many of our trading partners, uh, and with other uh, commercial factors, would make the U.S. a far, far more uh, competitive jurisdiction for doing business well. So before we conclude today's presentation and open the floor to questions from our listeners, uh, let's, let's do a recap on what we know now. In light of President Trump's tax plan and the final congressional session before recess, where do we go from here? Michael, you want to start us off? Uh, well, where we go from here is still anybody's question. Uh, you know, the uh, Congress has, uh, you know, has a blueprint that they've had out. And one of the uh, interesting things that's going on is in, in the Senate, uh, there's uh, some uh, move to uh, go back to a uh, proposal that was made in 2014 uh, by Congressman uh, Camp uh, and, and look at that proposal. That proposal you know, was, was good for its time the problem is that it's, uh, there are things that have changed in the tax code since then that it didn't take into account. And so there's, uh, there's sort of some issues reviving uh, the, the camp proposal. Uh, but there's also you know, a lot of unintended consequences, and as there always are whenever you make a change. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, there's some argument to be made that the, the Tax Reform Act of 86 by uh, caused the SNL crisis of 88, that uh, the, uh, the change in investment uh, caused SNL to not be able to get repaid on their loans and the whole house of cards collapsed. One of the unintended consequences that we're looking at the lowering of the corporate rate is investment in things like low-income housing. Right now, uh, low-income housing in this country is primarily financed through low-income housing tax credits all of which are bought by corporations because they're really the only ones who can benefit from it. And they're priced, quite frankly, based on the tax benefits. If those tax benefits are reduced because the rate is reduced from 35 to 15%, it's not entirely clear what would happen both to uh, uh, current investments that might have a, a repricing mechanism in them, uh, investments that are in process that are currently being negotiated, but also the uh, investments in the future it's going to make those much more expensive and, and much more difficult to finance. Uh, there's also, you know, look at the, the idea that all business income would be integrated. There are some writers out there who believe that there's going to be a flood of new flow-through entities uh, because people will view that as a tax shelter. Uh, and, and again, the issue is going to be exactly what is the business income of a flow-through entity and how is that going to be taxed? Is it going to be, uh, you know, all the income? Is it going to be a percentage? Camp's proposal was 70% uh, compensation, 30% uh, business income. Is it going to go to some sort of an arbitrary formula like that? 
or is it going to be just, you know, the Wild West and, you know, we'll be fighting with the IRS for years about what gets taxed at what rate? Um, if I can just speak for a minute um, with regard to the unintended consequences of the elimination of the estate tax. Um, that's something that I know is near and dear to, to me, to the clients that, that I assist with. And, I mean, certainly, the elimination of any tax is, um, you know, is thought of as, as a wonderful thing. But from a planning perspective, where, where I see the biggest concern is that this would literally, you know, turn estate planning as we know it on its head. Um, many of our clients right now are so hesitant to pull the trigger on, on any type of estate planning, and right now the motivator is reduction in taxes or elimination in taxes, and yet the trigger is not pulled and documents are not signed and trusts are not done, and, and people find themselves even on simple wills just because there's such a hesitation to do proper estate planning. But now if, if there's talk of eliminating, eliminating the estate tax in its entirety, um, I fear for succession planning just in general. Um, there's so many things that go on or, or that need to happen in order to have a successful succession plan, in order to make sure that, that business owners continue to have that cash stream that they need upon retirement or even upon, um, God forbid, their death where their surviving spouse or their family needs to continue with that cash stream. And if you don't have a successful succession plan, um, all of that could be for naught. Um, so I just wonder, without you know, without even having tax as the motivator, um, are we going to see less and less of the succession plan that we even see today? And I could just see that as a problem um, for businesses continuing to be successful in the future. Um, my other concern is, quite frankly, is for charities. So many estate plans um, have charitable contributions built into uh, their wills where a charity will ultimately be a beneficiary or they'll be split interest trusts where a charity will be, a, whether it's a current beneficiary or a remainder beneficiary. If there isn't the, um, the need or the, the want or the, uh, the benefit to charitable deductions as there once was, um, whether it's from an income tax perspective or an estate planning perspective, what does that mean to charitable organizations and, and their need for funding and their lack of funding already, um, what place does that put them in? So that's, you know, a, another issue that I see is something that's, that's going to have to be talked about and discussed and it's just so extremely important at all levels, whether it's the business level, individual level, or the nonprofit level. Um, great point, Kim. We're also, we're seeing one uh, interesting unintended consequence that's already happening. Uh, because of the fact that uh, clients have asked us, for example, well, what do I do you know, with respect to tax reform and the President's proposals? And our, our advice has been to put off transactions to 2017, to 2017 or beyond uh, to try to defer income. Uh, the early statistics from the 2016 returns are that about 20% of income has been deferred so that tax collections are down. The government has actually collected less money from 2016 income tax, and so uh, you may have heard that the President asked Congress, uh, not very loudly, to uh, extend the debt ceiling before they leave for their August recess. They had anticipated not doing that until uh, later in the year, but the government is actually running out of money because people who have means who are able to do so are actually deferring their income, and so they haven't paid tax on it yet. They haven't sold things that would be could potentially be taxed at a lower rate, then they haven't uh, uh, collected income that uh, you know similarly could be taxed at a lower rate. So it's costing the government money just sitting around waiting to figure out what's going to happen. Right. And, and isn't it true, Mike, I've heard that you know many of our clients are asking when could we potentially see something enacted. And I've heard the earliest could, would be year end, which is quite frankly maybe unlikely. Um, and many are saying second quarter 2018 before anything could potentially happen. One of the things that I'm hearing, uh, and the reason that the, that the President and Congress have been pushing to try to get this done uh, before September is typically, uh, you know, the way Congress works is if you don't get something done in the first six to eight months of the term, uh, it becomes very difficult to do because everybody's out raising money, running for re-election, or actually out campaigning. And so the issue is, 
uh, whether Congress will have the will to take on something as potentially uh, explosive as serious tax reform uh, in, in the period after, say, October, when they start focusing on the November 2018 elections. Thank you, uh, Mike, Tim, and Ryan. Uh, we have a bunch of questions, so I want to cut off the presentation portion right now and, and move to the questions. Um, Ryan, uh, one of our listeners would like to know if you could briefly explain how the VAT works. Uh, sure. So the way that, uh, that a value-added tax works is that with each level of production, uh, with each sale, uh, each transaction, the VAT is imposed. But then for the – so if, if you consider a good that is uh, partially manufactured, uh, let's call it step A, then sold to uh, someone else to further manufacture, then sold to a wholesaler, then sold to a retailer, then sold to a consumer. The, the first step in the manufacturing process would sell to the second step and charge VAT. When the second uh, uh, party sells to, finishes the good and sells to the wholesaler, they also charge VAT on the entire balance uh, or the entire amount of the sales proceeds, but then they get a credit for the VAT that they were charged by the first uh, person producing the, the good. And the, the process goes on. The wholesaler charges VAT on the higher price that they charge to the retailer, but get a credit for the price for the VAT that they paid to the, uh, the final manufacturer. And of course, the retailer then uh, sells to the consumer and so it's really only the consumer that bears the full uh, brunt of the cost. The issue that comes up with the VAT, however, is that VAT only applies to consumption that occurs within the jurisdiction. So when you export something, no VAT is imposed, and any VAT that may have been built into the component costs is recovered. Um, and uh, when you import something, VAT is imposed at the time of importation. So uh, this is part of the reason why uh, the Republicans are in favour of uh, a BAT or the Border Adjustment Tax because they see some similarities between how the Border Adjustment Tax would work and the, how the VAT works, um, but they're not, not quite the same thing. Michael, um, one of our listeners is asking if you've heard anything about tax reform affecting uh, REITs uh, or the tweaking of the earnings and profits calculation? Uh, there has, again, one of the things I think we've been saying consistently throughout this presentation is that there's, there's a, a lack of detail. Uh, there's certainly a, a lack of detail as to how this would affect uh, real estate investment trusts uh, as well as, uh, you know, regulated investment companies and other uh, similar types of hybrid corporate flow-through entities. The, the interesting thing, again, is the, is the interplay between uh, the corporate tax rate and the individual tax rate. Uh, that's less significant for REITs because currently uh, dividends from REITs are not eligible for uh, the lowered rate of 15%. So it's not clear whether uh, the actual change in rates would have any effect, but we haven't heard any specific proposals uh, with respect to REITs otherwise, whether anything is going to change, uh, you know, in terms of how they're taxed, in terms of, uh, you know, their, their continued existence, in fact, as a tax-favored entity. Uh, we similarly don't know whether there's going to be any you know, expansion of the, of the dividend pay deduction and whether that might, in fact, factor into how corporations in general would achieve a lower rate. So all this you know, all of this is, is what makes it difficult for, uh, uh, for us to figure out uh, how to advise clients and also what the, the overall picture of tax reform is going to look like and how they're going to make it work seamlessly given how complex the code is and how short the proposals are right now. And if we don't get to all the questions, we're going to uh, contact people individually and try to answer their questions. Kim, uh, one of our listeners uh, was present at our 2016 webinar and recalled uh, how we talked about tax simplification and how people wanted tax simplification. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, 
Do you think that the new Trump proposal addresses this tax simplification? Um, you know, it's funny. That that was, I mean, that was the overwhelming cry from, from everyone in that survey, um, whether it was, you know, business leaders, individual taxpayers, whomever it was. They just, again, they just want to understand uh, what they're paying taxes on, what deductions they're getting benefits for. Um, I think for many people, because of the doubling of the standard deduction, it will mean simplification. Uh, itemized deductions will go away for many individuals and will go from a seven um, bracket system down to three. Um, but for others, I don't see simplification. Um, you know, uh, with things like the 15% tax for, for businesses and, or, and whether it's flow through or corporate, you know, what does that mean? And, and what is that form going to look like? And, and what does that mean to K-1s and the flow through from those K-1s and different classes of income and how they'll ultimately be taxed? Um, I just, it's, it's just going to be another thing, another thing for all of us to understand and learn and interpret. Um, certainly things like the elimination of the alternative minimum tax would be um, a welcome change um, and the, you know, net investment income tax possible elimination and Medicare, Medicare surcharge. All of those things factor into how tax is currently calculated and by, you know, chipping away at those little items here or there certainly help. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, simplification goes much further than just reduction of tax brackets from seven to three and, and doubling of the, the, the standard deduction. Thank you, Kim. Brings us to the end of our time allotment, and I want to thank Kim, Ryan, and Mike, and I want to thank all our participants, all our listeners, and uh, we hope that uh, you gained a further insight into uh, the Trump tax proposal and what it could mean to all of you. And with that, uh, Sandra, any last-minute comments? Thank you very much, speakers, and ladies and gentlemen, this does conclude today's program, and we would very much appreciate you completing the survey that is now appearing on your screen. Thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect. <laughs>